Jesus Christ claimed to be the light of the world and those who followed him they would not walk in darkness but have light what does this mean what will you do with Christ's claim what if you choose not to follow him uh, all right if you have your bible turn with me please to John 17 i want us to look at verse 17 and then we will stand up and make our declaration before we get into god's word John chapter 17 and verse 17 Jesus said Sanctify them by your truth your word is truth your word is truth God's word is truth So this is one foundation on which we build our lives that is the word of god god's word is truth it means that in any given situation we choose to believe what the word of god says no matter how difficult things may look how bad things may look what is the word what does it say this is truth truth will outlast a lie a lie may seem very big very uh consuming at some point but truth always outlasts the lie or you know, we have a common saying truth prevails and it does always outlasts a lie so we are safe absolutely safe when we believe the word of god thy word is truth this is eternal This is what we build our life on. This is what we base our life on. And when you and I build our lives on God's word and what it says, we are standing on secure and solid ground, the word of God. Amen. Let's stand to our feet right now as we make our declaration as we say what what God's word says is what God's word declares for us this morning. Just when you hold your Bible high up in the air, let's say this out loud, bold and strong together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ. and a channel of his blessing to many people i receive his word i believe his word and i live by his word christ is my master and to him i am an absolute surrender in jesus name amen god bless you may be seated The Lord Jesus made several claims for himself during his earthly ministry. Several bold statements that he made about who he was and what he had come to do. Listen to some of these. For instance, Jesus said, <clears throat> "I am the bread of life." before abraham was i am so imagine for the jewish people that must have rocked their mind they're thinking what you're hardly 30 years old and you're saying before abraham was i am he didn't say before abraham was i was before abraham was i am meaning using the very title that they ascribe to god almighty the eternal god i am the god who lives outside time jesus is using that same title for himself before abraham was i am he said i am the door of the sheep meaning i am this this entry point into this other world this this realm of eternal life i am the door he said i am the good shepherd he said i am the resurrection and the life 
I am the true vine. And he even dared to say this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Think about these claims, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. And after his death and his resurrection, in, in his revelation to John, he said other things. He said, I am he who lives. And was dead. And behold I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He said I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. I am the Alpha. The Omega. I am the beginning and the end. That means everything in between is held together in me. That's a huge claim. He said several things. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David. I'm the bright and morning star. Jesus, if you look at his earthly life, was really an insignificant person. I mean, he was just a carpenter. Didn't graduate from college. Wasn't born in some, you know, princely family. He was born in a small little town. So it really had nothing going. He was just a carpenter by trade. So he really had nothing going. And yet he would dare to stand up. And make such claims. Now think about this. If somebody in our world today stood up and made these kind of statements, what would you do with them? What would you think of them? I mean, what if your neighbor made these claims? One, you and I would probably think, man, he's really off his mind. He's really lost it. Something's gone wrong. We've got to send him to the institution. Right? Or we just say, no, no, no. He's just trying to fool people with all these claims. He's trying to just get people to come after him and do all that. And you know, what would we expect if somebody like this stood up and made these claims? We would certainly expect, we'll say, you know, just leave him alone because, you know, once he dies, all these things will fade away. And indeed, that's what's happened. You know, we've seen these kinds of things happen. So many God men and God women, whoever, they come on the scene. They, you know, they have a following. And then once they die, everything just dissipates and disappears. And, you know, somebody else comes. So, so we see that happen all the time. So here is this insignificant carpenter from a small little town. Who really had nothing in life. If you look at his, his earthly life. He never even traveled 200 miles. Away from the place that he was born. He never wrote a book. Today people promote a lot of their ideas on the internet. He never had any access to any of, te any of that technology. He wasn't on Twitter. He didn't have you know, a fan following of whatever. Millions. Nothing. He never built a building. He never founded an organization. He never created a religious system. Nothing. So, in all probability, you and I would say, you know, just let him be. And it all just pass away. In fact, Gamaliel, who was one of the leading professors in the Jerusalem University at that time said the very same words in Acts chapter 4. He said, you know, if this man is just another man, it'll die. It'll all go away. But if it's of God, he said, nothing can stop it. Luke 
Look back at history. Look back on the impact that this one insignificant life has had on human history. I dare say, I think most of you would agree, that no other human being who ever lived has had as great an impact on the world as this one insignificant carpenter from Nazareth, Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Nobody else. All of history is divided by his birth and death. I mean, you can't leave a greater mark than that. When everybody has to refer to your life in order to tell when they lived. Today, all over the world, people in almost every known language and tongue sing his praises. He never wrote a book. He never wrote hymnals. He never wrote songs. Institutions are built around his teachings. His words have outlived and outlasted anything else on earth. I dare say, you have to pay attention to him. You can't avoid his claims. This morning, I want us to look at one of these claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. And try to understand what he said. I want us to look at John chapter 8 and verse 12. Where Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of this world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. But will have the light of life. Literally, eternal life. I am the light of this world. Wow, that's pretty big. You mean to say the whole world is in darkness and you've come to be the light? That's what he's, he's saying, he's implying. I am the light of this world. Implying that the rest of this world is in darkness and he's come to bring the much needed light for this entire world. And then not only says that, he says, if you follow me, then you will not walk in darkness. I think you need to pay attention to that claim. Just like everything else, you can't ignore it. But let's try to understand it. When he said, I am the light of this world, he implied or he implies that this world is in darkness. This world needs light. And so here he is. Come to be that light. Now, in scripture, in the Bible, in biblical terminology, darkness is a figure of speech and and, and it at least represents three important things. First, darkness refers to spiritual blindness. Second, darkness refers to the power of Satan, the powers of darkness, the working of demons and demonic spirits. And third, darkness is also used to refer to the night seasons of life, the, the seasons when, when, when which all of us go through at various points and various stages in life when things just are hard, difficult, the night seasons. And scripture uses darkness in all of these three ways or in these three contexts. So let's apply what Jesus said and try to understand. When he said, I am the light of this world, what did he mean? First, he meant that he'd come to be light in the darkness of spiritual blindness. He'd come to bring light. People, we, you and I, are blind. 
We're talking about spiritual blindness. That means spiritually we are blind. We are unable to see. We are unable to comprehend spiritual reality. And he says, I've come to be your light. Now, let's do this exercise. Okay? Just a few minutes. I want you to close your eyes. Now, some of you already closed your eyes, but <laughs> keep it closed. <laughs> but for those who are have your eyes open, <laughs> all of us, let's just close our eyes for a minute. Okay? It's not a trick or anything. Just to make a point. Let's all close our eyes. Now, imagine you had to live life like this. Just imagine. I'm not saying you have to, but imagine you lived like life like this, where you couldn't see. You had you were blind. That we were blind. You as a person was blind. You had your eyes unable to see. Now, if suppose suppose somebody came and told you. There is light and there is darkness. Because you're blind, you have no way to comprehend it. You have no way to understand what they're meaning when they say there is light and there is darkness. So it's very easy for somebody who is blind to deny the existence of light and darkness. It's very easy. No, there is no light, there is no darkness. Because it's not tangible, it's not something I can experience, it's not experien experiential. They, they deny light and darkness because it's not part of their experience. Not because light and darkness does not exist, but because they have the inability to see light and darkness. And the second thing is this, when your eyes are blinded, you can also deny anybody else's ability to see because again, that's foreign to your personal experience. So you can say nobody else can see because I can't see. I don't know what it means to see. Now you can open your eyes. Hey, I had my eyes closed. Did you guys have your eyes closed? Oh, you guys watching me, right? <laughs> okay, here's the point. When we are blinded, there are two things. One, we can deny the existence of light and darkness. Why? Because it's foreign to our experience. We, it's not there. So when somebody says there is light and there's actually no, no, there is no light and darkness. It's foreign to you. And not only that. You can also deny other people's ability to see. Because it's foreign to your experience. So no, there's no such thing as spiritual blindness. There is no such thing as sp having your spiritual eyes open. That's, that doesn't exist. You can deny that. And you think it's real. But just because somebody denies light and darkness, does it mean there is no light and darkness? No. There is light and there is darkness. For those who have our eyes open, we identify light and darkness. And for those of us who have our eyes open, we identify the fact that you were once blind, but now you can see. The Bible talks about spiritual blindness in several places and I'll just make mention of one verse here in 1 Corinthians 2.14 it says the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned a man who is trying to understand spiritual things which is natural intellect he can't understand it he can't comprehend it the Bible says that why? Because it takes spiritual understanding to understand spiritual things. So every statement a natural man makes with his intellect about spiritual things is wrong. Because he's speaking of things he does not comprehend. He has no understanding about. Because the natural man does not understand the things of the spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. 
So into a realm like this, Jesus comes to say, I've come to be your life. I've come to open your eyes so that you can see, to bring you out of darkness into light. So John chapter 1 verse 4 says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. What does this light do? Verse 9, that was a light which gives light to every man coming into this world. The light that he brings is available for every person to illuminate us, to open our eyes, to be able to see spiritual truth, to comprehend spiritual truth. The Bible talks about in Ephesians 4.18, having the understanding that's darkened. The understanding is darkened, meaning you're unable to understand, unable to comprehend. In Acts 26, verse 18, Paul's commission was to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light. So now you understand what Jesus said in John 8, 12. I am the light of this world. What does he come to do? To open our eyes so that we could then move from darkness to light. Meaning you've moved out from that place where the spiritual, the spiritual truth is, uh, is something you cannot comprehend. You've come to a place where your eyes have been opened. You're now in light. You're able to comprehend spiritual truth. You're able to understand and know the truth. He said, I am the light of this world. I've come to be your light. Which means that it's going to take a personal encounter with Jesus Christ for our hearts and minds to be illuminated to understand spiritual truth. Because he's the light. And he is the true light which enlightens every person. Every person has this opportunity to come and through a personal encounter have their hearts and minds illuminated so they can now experience and understand and comprehend spiritual truth. It begins with a personal encounter with the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. The second thing, darkness refers to the power of Satan in scripture. So Jesus said, I am the light of this world. I've come here to deal with darkness as in the powers of darkness. Acts 26 in verse 18, in Paul's commission, the Lord says, I want you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So look at these synonymous terms. Darkness to light. The power of Satan to God. So darkness here. Talking about the power of Satan. The dominion, the influence, the control of the devil and his demonic powers. 1 John 5.19 the Bible says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The entire world, the world's system is under the sway, under the influence of the wicked one. It's what the scripture says. So in this context, Jesus says, I've come to be the light. I've come to displace what darkness is doing. I've come to bring people out from the power of Satan unto God, I've come to be the light of this world. And if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. That means this realm where Satan and his demon, demons operate will no longer be able to have their sway or their control over you if you follow me. Is what he said. I've come to be the light of this world. But unfortunately, <clears throat> the Bible tells us this. You know, in that same passage, Jesus is talking about the love of God and, 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 and he's talking with Nicodemus and explaining to him that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. In that same passage in John 3, and over in verse 19, Jesus said, This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So what's man's default response? Men love darkness rather than 
light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. The light has come into the world, but this is the condemnation. This is the judgment here. The light, the light has come, but men love darkness rather than light. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So man's default response is, I want to stay in darkness because I want my deeds, I want my, the wrong, I want it to be covered. Lest when I walk into the light, what I'm doing be exposed and then I need to align myself to the light. I need to do the truth. I need to do what's right. But the Lord Jesus Christ steps into this realm of darkness and he says, look, I've come to be your light. If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. That means I've come here to display the control of Satan. I've come here to display the control of demonic powers, their influence over your life. And that's what he does. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, the Bible says that he delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. What does he do? He delivers us from the powers of darkness. He takes us out from there and he brings us into his kingdom, the kingdom of light, kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. So, it is the person of Christ, it is in the person of Christ that each one of us have the opportunity to be brought out from the powers of darkness into the light of God. Because he is the one who delivers us from the powers of darkness and translates us into the, his own kingdom. Finally, in closing here, darkness refers to the night seasons of life. It means that, you know, all of us go through these night seasons. No one is exempt. There could be tragedy. There could be the loss of a dear one. There could be delays. There could be all kinds of challenges in life. We go through those seasons. But in those seasons, he says, I'm your light. There are several scriptures on this. I just want to refer to two here before we pray. I like these two verses in Micah chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. I know I preached it a few times here in church. Verse 7, Micah says, Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Now, there are those seasons in life when you find yourself sitting in darkness. Which means, it's that night season of life. Everything is so still. Nothing is happening. You wish things would happen very quickly. But nothing's moving. It's dark. You can't see ahead. You don't know what's up ahead. Things are uncertain. It's those night seasons. And Micah is saying, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. He's our light. He says, don't rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When it's not the end. I'm not, I'm maybe knocked down I'm not knocked out. Amen? Because the Lord will be a light to me. He's going to pick me up. Or like it says in Psalm, verse 30, chapter 30, verse 5, His anger is but for a moment, His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the a weeping may endure for a night. Yeah, we go through those night seasons. We go through those times when there are tears that we cry and, 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 and the night seems so silent. It seems so lonely. It seems hard sometimes. It seems long. But weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Because the Lord is my light. 
He's going to turn my night into day. He will do it. So, my question to you and me is this. We cannot ignore this claim of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the light of the world. So it's not a nice fanciful thing thing saying, okay, okay, let me get one of those tube lights, put it up there. The Jesus tube lights in my house. That's not about it. He's not talking about that. What's he calling us to? He says, you've got to make a choice. What's it? If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. So that's the bottom line. That's the question mark. That's the call. Will you follow this one who claimed to be the light of this world and who said, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. What are you going to do with the claim of Christ? Will you follow him? Would you say yes to this person, to Jesus Christ, so that he can bring illumination to your heart and mind, help you begin to understand spiritual realities, bring you and me out of darkness into the, his own kingdom, and be with us through those night seasons of life, which all of us go through. What will you do with the claim of Christ? Whoever follows me, Jesus said, will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The question is, will you follow him? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray. Call our worship team up, please. As we said at the very beginning, we can't take the claims of Christ lightly. There's no other man, no one else, who dared make the claims that Jesus Christ made. And he's got history to show that even though he never himself did anything to promote his work, his impact on mankind, on on human history, far outweighs anybody else, anyone else. Absolutely. This had to be the Son of God. This had to be who he said he was, the great I am, who came into our world to lead us into the truth. He is the truth. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed here in this place, please, I want you to ask yourself this question. If Jesus Christ is really who he claimed he was, the light of this world. And if his his statement is true that those who follow him will not walk in darkness but have the light of life, then what am I doing about it? Am I really following him? And to follow him in that context is not just a casual understanding of him, of Christ, but to be a disciple, that's a follower. Somebody who devotes some life to the studying and the understanding of of the master and aligning their lives gradually, more and more, progressively to the life of the master. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? How will you respond to this claim? Would you say, Jesus... I'm making a decision this morning to follow you. To become a disciple. To somebody who embraces you for who you really are. God who became man, who died for my sins on the cross, who was buried, who rose up again, and who's who's come to give me eternal life and, and change me and make me a new person and And teach me things concerning the kingdom of God. 
Would you make that choice, that decision? Be a follower of Jesus Christ is the question. I'm going to let the band lead us for a few moments. You consider this in your heart. What would you do with the claim of Christ? And I'm going, to come, I'm going to come back and then lead us in a time of prayer. Giving us the opportunity to make this decision. To be followers of the one who said, I am the light of this world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to
many years ago, this is a long time ago, when I was in school, just before my 13th birthday, so it's just close to becoming 13. I remember one afternoon, one of my classmates, and we were in the school football team together, we're close friends. Usually during lunch break, we should go and play football. But that afternoon, he said, do you want to come with me to chapel? Uh, I was, he's a, he was actually from a non-Christian background, so I found it strange that he was going to chapel. I said, okay, I'll come with you. So we went to the school chapel. This was Bishop Cotton Boy's school. <clears throat> there was uh, Mr. Andrew Taylor there. I recognized him. He was a biology teacher. He taught us biology in English. And so he saw me. He said, you come back tomorrow. So I went back the next day during lunch break. He took me aside. And he said, have you received Christ into your life? You know, I've been going to church with my parents. So I thought, yeah. Yeah probably did. You know, so I told him yes, <laughs> not knowing what all that meant. Now, just to be sure, he asked me another question. He said, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? And that was the first time I heard the Lamb's book of life. I said, no, I, I don't know about that. Then he turned into the Bible to Revelation 20 verse 15, where the scripture said, Anyone whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into a lake of fire. That's pretty strong. So he said, would you like to pray and ask God to write your name in the Lamb's book of life? I said, sure. So he led me through a simple prayer. I, I, I didn't feel anything, nothing big. But I just simply prayed, God, write my name with the Lamb's book of life. And then he prayed a little prayer over me saying, God, just bless him, make him a blessing. But you know, in that moment that was so mundane, so ordinary, so simple, nothing special about that moment, something changed, something happened. Because from that day, suddenly, I had a desire to read the Bible, to go after this God whom I thought I knew, but even though I didn't understand him yet, there was a pull in my heart towards this God. Something happened that day. In a very ordinary moment, something deep happened. I wonder if there are people here this morning who need that moment in their lives. But you need to say, in simple words, I want to follow this Jesus Christ. The one who said, I am the light of this world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Maybe you feel in your heart a need to do that. Uh, you feel like, I need to do that this morning. I want that to happen to me. Whatever that happened to him, I want it to happen to me. I want to lead you in a simple prayer this morning. I can't explain how it happens, but I know it happens. And it happens over and over again in the lives of people. It's his work. He does it. Could we just close our eyes, please, for... If there are people here this morning... You've never asked the Lord to come into your life and become your light, to enlighten you spiritually, to give you this light of life. If you've never made that deliberate choice to be a follower of Jesus Christ, not a Christian by name, but a follower of Jesus Christ, he who follows me is what Jesus said. If you would like to do that this morning, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Would you say this with me? 
Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. Be my light. Be my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. I believe you died for me, that you rose up again, and you're alive today. Help me to follow you the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed this prayer for the very first time in your life, if you've never done this before, but you prayed this prayer for the very first time, I just want you to lift your hand up. I want to see you. how many of you prayed this prayer for the very first time this morning. Just go ahead, lift your hand up. Let me see. Anybody else? Anybody prayed this prayer? The very first time this morning. Just put your hand up. Don't see anybody here. See one up there in the balcony. Praise God for that. Anybody else? Up in the balcony. You prayed this prayer for the very first time in your life. Anybody else? Okay, just keep your hand up because our ushers will come to you and they'll give you a green bag. That bag has information for you on how to grow in your faith, some direction on how to read the Bible, spend time in prayer, and spend time getting to know the Lord more and more. If you prayed this prayer but you didn't raise your hand up, please make sure you pick that green bag up. You'll find it with the ushers on each of the exits. Take that with you. It's God information to help you grow in this faith. To read your Bible, pray, spend time with God's people. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time together in your presence. And Jesus, we thank you. that You are our light. And you said if we follow you, we will not walk in darkness, but we will have the light of life. And I pray in Jesus' name that the light of God floods every heart, every life in this place, illuminating our hearts and our minds to understand spiritual truth, breaking up every yoke of darkness, every work of darkness, Lord dispelling it out of our lives and causing us, Father, even in the night seasons of life, to be filled with hope, knowing that the Lord will be our light and that the morning will come. We just thank you, Father, for doing this, for confirming your word in our lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. and Lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.